tonight's message called Optical Illusions, and it's taken from uh, taken from James two five. Okay, that's the passage of scripture we're going to be talking about. And the main thought is uh, people should be treated according to their standing with God. That's the main thought of the text, James 2.5. So an optical illusion, like you see on the screen, is simply a, physical, uh, a visual trick. And if a real is a word puzzle, then an optical illusion is an eye puzzle. Uh, let's put a couple of these photos up on the screen. Here's one example of an optical illusion. Here's one example of an optical illusion. How many red balls are up there on the screen? Five. Count them up. There's more than five. Count them up. Count the red balls. Oh, they're hard to see, but you can see them. Count them up. Did you say there's five red balls? Yeah, there's five. Are you absolutely positive? No. Wait, I'm looking. Read, uh, uh, recount. One, recount two, again. Three, four, there's probably like five million. Can you see another? No. One, two, three, Look oh, closer. Got 12 fingers. Are you... Hey, hey, she got it. Where? This dude got six fingers on each hand. <laughs> right, but look, when, you, when I first looked at this thing, wow, Trinity, you're amazing. You truly are gifted because after like a minute and a half, you notice that. I almost didn't use this illustration because when I was looking up optical illusion illustrations, this was like the top one and I was like, bro, but there's five balls. What are they talking about? I stared at this thing for 15 minutes and then it hit me like, ah, yo, this dude's got six fingers on each hand. Oh, it blew my mind. So the whole time you're looking at the red balls with the optical illusion is, look like a regular dude got six fingers. <laughs> that is crazy. So you never, you never thought the answer was right in front of your eyes the whole time, right? You were like, "Yo, there's five red balls there," but the whole thing is there was uh, six fingers. So I was like, "Crazy." Anyway, here's a couple of other photo optical illusions. Go ahead, put the other one up there. I know this one. That's easy. I know. That's easy. Look at that. <laughs> optical illusion, like he's missing his head. Why would you bury your face? That's pretty crazy. Look, as they bury his face. And they bury the body, but it looks like the dude's head is gone. And that's his head right next to him. Like he's holding his head. Crazy. Alright, hit the next one. This looks like a little girl that's holding a, 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 like a little woman in her hand. Like a little, like a little doll there. Optical illusion, right? She's on a hill and it's further away. But when you look at it at first, you say, yo, is she holding it like a little person in her hand? Yeah. You guys are too smart, man. I mean, I can't get nothing by you. Yeah. All right, let's look at this next one, because this thing had me blown. Oh, <laughs> no. This one was just brown ones. He said, I'm going to just stick my whole head up there, man. <laughs> this dude, and then he got his head stuck in his butt. <laughs> Yo, I thought that joke was hilarious. Hilarious. All right, you can take that one out because that's disturbing. <laughs> All right, anyway, uh, you know that that people can be optical illusions as well. Uh, uh, when I was a child, I went trick or treating, right? And I remember uh, two years in particular uh, when I was trick or treating of what I was. One year I was dressed up as Casper the Friendly Ghost. Oh, I love Casper. Mm -hmm. And then another year, I was dressed up as a football player. Oh, of course. Oh. You know, they sent a little, a little kit to, to dress up as a football player. So, But nobody saw me if I was really, uh, as if I was really Casper or a football player. People knew that I was really just a kid. Uh, while I was in costume, I was given off an illusion by pretending to be something that I wasn't. Uh, sometimes people do this in everyday life. They give off an illusion of who or what they uh, really are, and, and we see them and treat them differently based upon the illusion of who they are 
rather than who they are in reality. So, how many of us can identify with that? Let's identify with it. I know that I've treated people differently based upon what I think them to be. Maybe you have too. Maybe we think that someone has a lot of money because of the things they wear or things they have and we see them differently because of that. Maybe we think that someone is nasty because they smell weird or uh, they don't have a nice, uh, nice of things or as we do or we see them differently. Maybe someone has a different style preference and we see them differently because of their style preference. What I'm getting at is this. All these things are optical illusions that are distracting us from the reality of whom people really are. Of whom these people really are. We can't see people differently based upon their clothes, their style, their money, toys, their popularity, or even their, their smell. All of these things are optical illusions, just eye tricks or distractions from reality of who they really are in life. People should be seen according to their standing uh, to their standing with God. People need to be seen according to, to the way that God sees them. God loves people. So let's look at uh, James 2.5. It tells us, listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love them? Or those who love him? The obvious answer to James' question is yes, because Jesus taught in Luke 20, looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. So James 2, 5, it tells us that God has chosen the poor. Those that do not have a lot of material wealth. Those that are trusting in God rather than trusting in money. To be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom of God. So point number one. God has chosen the poor to be rich in faith. So what is faith? Faith is when trust is placed in something that cannot be seen. <clears throat> James says that God has chosen the poor, those that trust in God, rather than trusting in money to be rich in faith. God makes these people rich in faith by giving them faith. Their lack of wealth is making them call out to God, and He is responding not by giving them money, but by giving them faith, which helps them to trust in Him more and more every day in life and for everything they need in life. Not only did God choose the poor to be rich in faith, but also He chose the poor to inherit His kingdom. Point number two. God has chosen the poor to inherit the kingdom of God. An inheritance is when someone takes possession of something that was left to him or her by another. For example, when a grandfather passes away, he leaves an inheritance for his three daughters. The inheritance that he leaves them is a house that is worth is a house that is worth about a quarter of a million dollars, and so they sell it, they sell the house, and then they split the money. Uh, just like uh, the grandfather chose his three daughters to receive his inheritance, God chose uh, and he chooses the poor to inherit. In other words, take possession of his kingdom. Who are the poor that James is speaking about in this passage? <clears throat> the poor are those that are trusting in God rather than trusting in money. God has chosen these people to inherit his kingdom. What does it mean to inherit the kingdom of God? The Bible does not speak of the kingdom of God as a geographical location, but it rather speaks of it as a mindset or a worldview. The kingdom of God is anywhere that God is king. Did y'all catch that? The kingdom of God is anywhere that God is king. And while that can refer to a location, most of the time it refers to a life. It refers to a life. My life is God's kingdom because God is king over my life. And I'm his servant. So when James says that the poor inherit the kingdom of God, what he's saying is that those that trust in God are making him king of their life, and therefore 
They are inheriting His kingdom. So, application. Let's apply this whole thing to our lives. Here's the application. And all this discussion, James is making the point that people can be optical illusions. People may not be what they appear to be. The wealthy seems to have all the power and all the influence in the world, but God has chosen those who are trusting in Him to be the power players, to become rich in Him, in His faith, and to be inheritors of His kingdom. Even if they don't look like it. Even if they don't look like it. That's who He's chosen. In order to figure out these visual puzzles, we can't use the world standards. You know, catch that? In order to figure out these visual puzzles, we can't use the world standards, such as status, popularity, money, influence, or position, to figure out who is important. We have to see people the way God sees people. God sees people according to their spiritual condition, what's on the inside. God sees the heart of the person who really trusts Him, who doesn't. So we must see people as God sees people by their spiritual condition. How do we do that? You can see someone by their spiritual condition by examining their behaviors. The Bible and botany teaches us that good trees bear good fruit and that bad trees bear bad fruit. The Bible takes this principle and applies it to people. Good people do good work and bad people do bad works. By examining things that a person does, we can get an idea of where the person stands with God. We can't treat people by our standards of right and wrong or culture standards of right and wrong. We have to treat people according to God's standard of right and wrong. We don't have time to look at it right now, but Colossians 3 and Galatians 5 both have a list of things that are right and wrong according to God's standards. So if you haven't read those, remember it, read it. Colossians 3, Galatians 5. And if we're going to see people the way that God sees them, then we need to examine them by God's standard. So, will you look at people... Um, Will you look at people the way that God looks at them this week? For the rest of this week? First and foremost, with a loving and caring heart. This is a challenge for you guys. This is my little inspiration, my little pep talk. Look at people the way that God looks at them for the rest of this week. First and foremost, with a loving and caring heart. Because God is patient and merciful. Will you look at people through the eyes of Jesus this week? How would you treat that person that sits next to you different if you saw them the way God sees them? How would you see your mom and dad, your brothers and sisters, different if you saw them the way God sees them? How would you see the other members in this youth group if you saw them the way that God sees them? We must see people according to their spiritual condition, seeing them the way that God sees them. Don't be fooled by outward appearance of a person. Don't treat people by what you see. Treat them by their spiritual condition and see the way that God sees them. Does that make sense tonight, Joe? Yes, <laughs> so many times we get in these, these judgmental mindsets, and, and especially in high school. I know I used to go on a lot when I was in school, and I'm sure that hasn't changed, you know? We get in our little cliques and we're like, yo, that dude, you know. You know buddy, yeah, that dude, that dude stinks. You know what I'm saying? This dude ain't got the right shoes. I ain't chilling with him. You know what I'm saying? Man, that, that girl, man, she's just a, you know, you know. We got all kinds of things that we, seriously, that we do. And sometimes we, we even fall right into the traps of the world. And, and, and we say cuss words. We live just like them. They don't see they don't see anything different in us. I know you may look around and see some empty seats in here. We can fill these seats if we really begin to live out loud what Christ has done in our lives. 